bad law. And I believe that'll never happen again. I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, and so he, he essentially, in my mind, was always a lawyer's lawyer. He read yeah. law. Yeah the way the British do, by right. osmosis, soaking it up in a country lawyer's practice. And he loved to refer to himself as a country lawyer. He did. You get so you discount that a little bit, yeah. because <laughs> it's, uh, it's part of the bag of tricks of a lot of urbane, sophisticated, uh, invincible lawyers. But I think in this case, it was largely true. Yeah. I'm calling you from uh, Albany, New York, and uh, you, may, you probably are aware of the fact that what little formal legal education he had was a year at the Albany Law School here. Stands out in my mind that was true. Was yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was over there the other day, and that's where I got the copy of the uh, uh, biography from. And they're very proud that he passed through their, their portals, even if briefly. It's a frost says somewhere, freedom is moving easy in harness. <laughs> And when you think of the job he did of furnacing, yeah. not only those uh, wildly independent sovereignties, the big four, You're right. and uh, then when you get inside his own domestic establishment, all the wild rampant egos you had inside the American staff, not only the lawyers but the translators, to hold that thing in steady and to stay on target is, tells you something about his sense of endurance. Well, I, I think uh, Jackson said somewhere that the inescapable objective was to write a record that would outlast the hammers of the critics. That's a good said, phrase. I want to write a record that uh, could be looked at for the next thousand years by seminars in international law at the University of Vienna or Berlin Leipzig, what have you, yes. and will withstand the hammers of those critics. And the way yes. you do that is by convicting them out of their own mouths. Whereas if you put up some flashy witness right. that has a lot of sex appeal and it gets all the media interested yeah. and so on, yeah. but when you realize the, uh, the fragility of human testimony because of the possible mistakes of memory, narration, bias, self-interest, and so on, yeah. uh, it's, it's not as reliable if you're looking to the ages, the perspective of time. So I want documentary of it. There are two kinds of defenses. Uh, I didn't do it. It was 12 other guys. Right. Or I did it under duress. Yeah. You did not hear from them. This did not happen. It was all, well, Hitler's responsible, right. and, yeah. but... And the reason Jackson locked them into that was he was convicting them out of their own mouth. Yeah. First of all, you have the Nuremberg Decrees. Right. It'd be like convicting our people out of the United States Code. Yeah. And you've got one of the authors on the stand in Frick. Well, indeed. Uh, someone said uh, the worst thing about that Nazi conspiracy was not that little people got dragooned into it, like the kind of people that end up in the American Legion, the brown shirts, yeah. the guys that hang around the pool hall and so on. Right. The real heartbreaker, and I felt this when I was a student uh, in Germany before the war, it was the treason of the intellectual classes. It was the fricks. It was uh, the Walter von Schirach. It was uh, Speer, I think, is eminent in that realm. Classic example of it. Yeah. And what songs would they have sung if uh, Hitler did his little jig of joy <laughs> uh, when he devastated the Versailles Pact and did his little jig of joy in Paris? Uh, if, if they had been able to make that. Uh, aggression, that naked aggression, stick. Would there have been any critics in Germany at all? Yeah, see? exactly. It's, what kind of a criticism or an indictment of that whole experience is it to say, well, he lost the war? Not that he started it, but that he lost it. Yeah. So there's much to reflect upon, no question about it. When, how, did, how did you happen to, uh, 
to go to Nuremberg, Professor Lambert? Well, uh, I'm a school teacher, yep. and I was a school teacher before I was involved in the uh, military assignments. I was trained for the Far East, and the real estate didn't open up out there. Yep. So we were sent to Europe. So I end up with the Navy assigned to uh, Chafe, uh, Supreme Headquarters, yeah. and my little responsibilities were in the field of public safety and law, fine arts and monuments, <laughs> and General Bradley's staff, and uh, worked with that headquarters through, from London through the occupation of the Rhineland, right. and then Justice Jackson, through a representative, swept through Europe, and he had an executive order. Yes. And 99% of the American military had just one war aim at this point, was back home to mom and apple pie. Right. And I was one of those crazies that I would have given my right arm to be invited to participate in Nuremberg. Yeah. Because as a school teacher in the field of law, who could be excited about an intersection collision? <laughs> a product liability claim when yeah. you had a chance to sit in yeah. Yeah. on the greatest collision of ideologies the world has ever seen. Yeah. So instead of, will you consider joining the staff, I would have done anything to right. uh, be allowed to participate. So I leapt in with both feet, and uh, my first assignment was to, uh, there are two kinds of defendants, as you know. One was the institutional, the corporate defendant. Right. Right. Mine was the party. And I wrote the brief on the criminality of the Nazi party. And then I think, and you could check with my colleagues on this, I think the basic proposition was Jackson would give you the written assignment, and if you did an acceptable job of that, yeah. he would kind of reward you personally by letting you put in an oral case for the U.S. against one of the defendants. Yes. And then... Um, momentary suspension of his critical faculties, he found my brief acceptable and <laughs> gave me the yeah. case against Martin Borman yeah. and also against uh, Hess, but the British did not come through with the documentation on Hess. They had it from after they captured him. So one way or another, the bottom line was, I believe Jackson's position was, if you won't give us the material, then you put in the case against Hess and the media will ask you the embarrassing questions. And uh, I, my case then was limited to putting in the oral case against Borman. So the bottom line was I had two two assignments. One was the written one to write the brief against the Nazi party that I thought was the main vehicle of the conspiracy. And then to present to the tribunal the yeah. U.S. case against Borman. And that was the... So that was my involvement, and uh, I regard it as the peak, the, the acme of the professional opportunity and experience to participate in that international society. The greatest trial ever held in the history of the planet, as far as I can see. Who, who was it that uh, personally recruited you? I'm trying to remember this man's name, and it's obviously in the literature and in the record. Yeah. Uh, all I remember about him was that he was said to come from Philadelphia, he was very urbane and sophisticated and uh, had a fine gloss. It wasn't a varnish, but a real internal yeah. gloss. Yeah. And he was a class man. That's the way he came across to me. Yeah. And he flashed this executive order in effect said, I can hold anybody. Yeah. But what kind of a public servant do you get when you, you, you get him there by diktat? Right. So he knew he wanted people that were had internal conviction. And uh, how would you feel? And I said, I would love it. Where did I tell? Yeah. Where did this contact take place? In, in London, as I recall, at that moment, I was working with the Navy and court-martials. We were sitting in a court-martial uh, out in Southampton. Some poor fellow retired from the Operation Overlord, the cross-channel operation, that was sleeping and ran his LST up on a seawater uh, on a uh, harbor facility. And they were trying him for incompetence and bad seamanship and whatnot. And we were involved in that when this blonde Visigoth passed through with this <laughs> executive order. Yes. I was his man, uh, willingly. And uh, 
then from there to Nuremberg, watch the courthouse being rebuilt around you. That was a fascinating thing to see these SS men out there uh, engaged in manual labor in constructing the courthouse that would be used to try their top flight leadership. At, at, this, at this point, a, uh, a young naval officer like yourself lands in Germany and uh, there are certain words that are capable of sending a shiver through you, like Gestapo, SS, and now you see these guys lifting rubble, etc. What was your emotional reaction to that? Well, I think uh, the image I have in my mind is of, uh, just before the invasion of Poland, they were, I saw a newsreel, and it showed Mussolini and Hitler together had some Danubian diplomat in there, they were browbeating him on yeah. camera. Another independent state was losing its sovereignty, and uh, the Rippentropes were there, these men were living in the sun. And then to see them at the trial, when you looked into their faces at the trial, uh, someone threw a cigarette I saw to Rippentrop, and it fell on the floor, and he scrambled for it like a homeless beggar. And I thought to myself, you know, the old line, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. <laughs> where, where did you observe uh, Reuben Trump grabbing a butt? Well, it was in an interrogation. I can just remember that it was in a room and interrogation was going on. Yes. And uh, in the course of setting up the interrogation, the American somebody threw a cigarette at him and it rolled off the table onto the floor and he scrambled for it. Who is your immediate superior? Um, at least nominally, it would be Colonel Robert G. Story. Yeah. Um, he was the boss man. Yep. I don't think he's recruited the staff. That was done through this blonde gentleman. Yep. We arrived in place, and then Story was our boss. Yep. And he later became, um, well, he was president of the American Bar Association. Yep. And he was dean of the Southern Methodist Law Center yeah. in, uh, I guess it's Dallas. I'm going to, to stick my neck out on a conjecture, and you can chop it off if I'm wrong. I've talked to a number of people who uh, worked with or under Colonel Story, and I start to get a sense of the man as being, and especially in light of all of these subsequent positions, a pretty good legal politician, but not a great legalist, not a, a powerful lawyer. Was that your reaction? I don't think anyone ever accused him of being overly gifted in the academic department or the jurisprudential department. He was a manager. Yeah. And uh, there you need, in any kind of an institution, it's my impression, oil at the point of pressure, get people to pull in harness. Yeah. And he was very good at that. He was. Yeah, I think so. What, can you give me a, a, a sense of the man, and, uh, what kind of physical and personal uh, qualities he would project? I mean, if I sat down next to Colonel Story uh, on a train or in a bar, how would he come across to me? Well, I don't think the word charisma would ever occur to you. I don't think you'd, yeah. unless you had heard about him, yeah. you wouldn't actively be interested in knowing much about him. Yeah. It fade into the wallpaper. Yeah, and is, he, he, he's that uh, undistinguished in appearance as well, I would imagine. I would say that in appearance and in manner. Yeah. It yeah. was the record that uh, would be the basis of your uh, esteem of him, or yeah. appreciation of him. Yeah. The assignments were done very briefly. Right. Uh, I, I imagine it was Colonel Story that said, uh, you've been selected to write up the, the U.S. trial brief against right. the leadership core of the Nazi party and uh, go to it and start submitting some drafts yep. and so you went to work on that I can remember that part and uh, and just the, the briefs would be submitted to Justice Jackson and yep. he made a couple of brief comments I think that were written on the face of the brief uh, the essence of which was acceptable we'll use this and then eventually uh, it was my notion I don't know if anyone else agrees with it, that as a lanyap or a little reward, if the written work was acceptable, yeah. you'd be given the opportunity to present 
orally someplace in the case and mine was the case against Borman. So you got you got into court in the in the Borman matter. Yes. I would guess that among uh, ambitious and able young lawyers at Nuremberg, uh, getting into court would be a little bit like getting off the bench and getting into the game. There was that, but it would be even more than that. It would be like arguing a case in the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. It was a high altitude court. Right. And, uh, I think you were in the sun. I think we were all conscious of that, and that you, you had a hand in history. In the, in the Borman situation, you've got something of an anomaly uh, because the man isn't there and we don't know where he is. Uh, how did you feel about getting that case and how did you uh, think through how you would approach it? Well, uh, the general notion was convict him out of his own handwriting, out yeah. of his own documentation. As far as I know, that was undeviating. Yeah. And uh, the Germans kept book, books with Teutonic thoroughness. Yeah. For instance, uh, as I recall it, when uh, they introduced in evidence the book on the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto, right. it had been prepared under the authority of the Brigadier General von Schroep, yeah. if I remember his name correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And it uh, was bigger than the uh, Encyclopedia, Columbia Encyclopedia yeah. of Social Science. It was yeah. a real monster book, yeah. and it was done, in, uh, as far as you could tell from across the room looking at it, finely tooled Florentine leather. Yes. The kind of thing that loving attention might have been lavished on it, the sonnets from the Portuguese that you were giving as yeah. a gift to a loved one, or something like that. And uh, the inscription of it was. Uh, Mein Fuhrer, the uh, Warsaw Ghetto no longer exists. And then there was a statement in there by the Governor General. I can't remember the exact, but it's a matter of record. When we took over, there were 6 million Jews in Poland. Yes. Now there are 115,000. Whatever the figures were, mm. they were not those figures, but they were similar to it. You cannot kill all the lice at once. Yes. Period, close quote. And that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of evidence you had it. And right. as you went through this uh, book on the destruction of the ghetto, there would be pictures. They soundtrack the entire operation. Yes. And there would be pictures of these wretched people in uh, tenements and hovels jumping out of windows that where the buildings were in flames. This was the kind of... Yes. Uh, just like Hitler said, uh, 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 Adolf the Hun um, made millions of widows and orphans, but where is anybody around today to accuse him? And in the same way, we will win, and there will be no one around to say Jacques Yes. And uh, if you win, there is no one. You don't call a court to order. But uh, it didn't work out that way. Did you have to have any dealings um, with uh, the uh, German appointed as Bormann's defense counsel? None. Um, he never came to see me about a single document. Yeah. You would always give them a copy of what you were going to introduce beforehand. Was that required? It was required by, I assume, by court rule. It was undeviating. In other words, you would have a, a book uh, consisting of copies of the documents that you were going to introduce to support yeah. your contentions. Yeah. And those documents would be numbered and uh, codified and available. And I would... I, d I do not believe there was a, a, hardly a single instance during the entire trial where the authenticity of a single document yeah. was challenged by the defense. That's in Jackson's speech to report to Truman summing up the trial. We have had to prove incredible events by credible evidence. This far in advance where you expected to provide these to the, to the uh, Nazi defendants' councils? I can't remember the answer to that, but it was never an issue. Like someone saying, I've only had 24 hours right. to understand this and reflect on yeah. the implications of it. But I don't remember a single instance of that. No one knew. Did you have a gut feeling about whether or not this man was alive or not? No. My impression was, and I used to say in speeches, I hope he's alive. Yes. Because if he is, he's living like a hunted beast. Uh, yeah. The 
Israelis are after him, and a lot of other people who have an unsleeping vigilance about it will be after him, and he'll live like a beast in the field from hole to hole. I uh, reviewed for the Washington Post a book entitled The Bunker by a guy named O'Donnell, who was, a, I think, an AP reporter during the war. And he makes a fairly convincing case that uh, those indeed were Bormann's remains that were found somewhere in the 70s in, uh, in Berlin when some construction site was uh, when some construction was going on. I, w I wonder, do you feel that that was uh, the end of the Bormann story? Well, uh, my students used to have a lot of fun with me. They'd send me postcards saying, I'm alive and well, and cut your throat from here to here. Signed, Martin Bormann. <laughs> Even the store. What can you do with students? It's the same with all ages, all times, and all clients. <laughs> but there was this uh, man, highly credentialed uh, at Oxford, who was the, one of the British leading yeah. historians on Hitler. What the heck was his name? He writes articles in, in the New York Review all the time. Yeah. Uh, I know he, who you mean, so so constantly the name has been driven from my mind till after this conversation. Right, I think, exactly. I think he's uh, at Cambridge still. Right a very prolific scholar, and uh, he was one of their top uh, intelligence honchos. Right. And his report, I think, was that uh, the, the body in the bunker was indeed Hitler's, and that Borman... Trevor was, Roper, before I forget. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, H. Trevor Roper. That Borman was last seen walking alongside of a German tank that was set by a Russian yeah. anti-tank shell and, uh, yes. and fissionized. Yeah. And that was his... Uh, strongest impression and yeah. made that a matter of record. What purpose did the conspiracy charge serve? Well, um, that's the right question, but I don't know whether I'm the right person to put it to, yeah. which leads me to make this suggestion. Yeah. In my view, the two smartest guys at the old Nuremberg trial, uh, you hardly ever heard about them. Yeah. They were advisors to either Justice Jackson or advisors to the court. Right. Maybe they advise both. Yeah. But the two are um, uh, Benjamin Kaplan. Benjamin Kaplan. Yeah. And the other, if I can think of his name. I'll bet you you mean Wexler. Yes, Herbert Wexler. Yeah. The notion would be that the, uh, this common plan, uh, and if you can establish it, it tends to negative the fact that these acts charged were impulsive or heedless or inadvertent. Yeah. Most harms in life are the result of inadvertence or ingrained stupidity. There's not a heck of a lot you can do about either one. Yeah. What upsets you is where you get um, where you get planned, malicious, designed, coldly calculated yeah. callousness. The kind of stuff for which we apply punitive damages. Right. And the common plan tends to show that this thing was a cold-blooded calculation thought out in advance, and that it was more than just a gleam in somebody's eye. Yeah. It was a concept, and then it was implemented by acts. And that is a very fundamental notion in the common law world. And I grant you that not everybody that was in the dock at Nuremberg, the defendants, not everybody on the prosecution side yeah. is comfortable with that or that it's part of their tradition or their history, but it's it's fundamental in the common law. Yes. And so this was a meld, it was an amalgamation, a fusion of ideas. Right. In fact, if the rest of the world had been able to participate and cooperate and make adjustments and concessions and accommodations after Nuremberg as well as we did at Nuremberg, maybe we'd be a leg up on yeah. strengthening reason and the control of our affairs. While uh, at Nuremberg, did you uh, get involved at all with, oh, I guess you would call them seminars that Drexel Sprecher organized, which were held at the Grand Hotel in the evenings, where you, uh, particularly young prosecutors, would get together and discuss upcoming cases, approaches, issues, strategies, problems, etc.? Well, involved in the sense that I can remember attending them, yeah. or some of them. Yeah. And I thought they were a hell of a good idea, yeah. because we were all strangers to one another, pulled from the ends of the earth together, yes. and uh, you needed all the light and guidance that you could possibly get, and there's nothing like uh, 
a skull session yeah. to get together and uh, have a blackboard talk the way yeah. with, uh, before the Lakers and the Celtics tangle. Yeah. And they were personal and warm on the personal level, and I think they added clarity and force to the professional work that we were trying to do. And some of them were the, some of the most funny uh, occasions I can remember, especially if the top brass wasn't there. Yes. I remember we had one man on the staff whose uh, name I will not mention, um, if I, even if I could think of it, but he was sort of, uh, the, the friendly name for him was Major Hoople, <laughs> <laughs> a real windbag, and uh, somebody there that night at one of the seminars said, no, the next time he gets up to uh, deliver himself with some sage ideas, <laughs> I'm going to wiggle my two front fingers together, and I want you all to see it. Now, this uh, wiggling of the fingers comes from uh, an experience in ant society. The ants work together as a group, and they were zealously pushing a, 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 a heavy amount of uh, horse manure to the top of a hill, and it inadvertently escaped them and started rolling down the hill, and the head honcho ant on the top is vigorously wiggling his antennae together. Now, you don't know what this means, and I don't know what this means, but in that language, it means stop that horse manure. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, next time Major Hoople gets up, just pay attention to this, and he wiggled his fingers. And of course, when Major Hoople next unburdened himself, he wiggled his fingers, and I'm telling you, it was pandemonium. It relieved a bit of the tension. Yeah. So that was one of the ingredients, and a minor one of these seminars. What I do remember is that this was a small group of active workers. Yeah. And Jackson never tired of saying, they talk about all the time we're taking here. Yes. He says, I've presided over antitrust cases that have taken years and years. The, the, the American banana case and the optics case and motion pictures that go on for years and years when you're talking about accused and prosecutors of the same nation speaking the same language and the right. accessibility of it. And here we are putting this thing together and carrying it into execution within a short period of time with a handful of people. And to me, the bright line distinction between the Jackson trial and the, the succeeding uh, trial under Brigadier General, what was his name? Taylor. Telford Taylor. Telford Taylor. There, it was like a mass operation. The hundreds, it seemed to me, literally almost hundreds of people translators and uh, lawyers and God knows what. Yeah. Whereas Jackson, you had a handful because after all, who were the defendants? You yeah. had about 26, 23 of them and uh, you had about a finite number of criminal organizations and it would be one guy like Whitney Harris at the Gestapo and the yeah. SS, as I recall. And I think Drex worked on the SA and the general staff. I'm not too sure of that. Uh, my little thing was the leadership core of the Nazi party. I call it little, but it was the main vehicle of the yeah. conspiracy of the party. And Borman. So you're talking about a handful of people. And uh, they didn't include a lot of people that were very vocal and were very agitated and uh, making a lot of noise and, and uh, activity. Well, I suppose... That's something for you to sort out. There wasn't the a Circus Maximus aspect of it, because when did you have people that had all that imperial pomp and power? Yes in the dock like uh, common uh, right, right out of Dickens looking like a debtor's prison so to speak it was a big come down as I was saying yesterday the paths of glory leap but to the grave <laughs> the uh, uh, interesting parallel that Jackson draws with, with drawn out civil cases that he was familiar with do you recall the, the circumstances uh, under which he you heard uh, him deliver himself of this opinion well um the best place to find that is, for reasons unknown to me, Temple Law School gets a great deal of credit for assembling and preserving as a repository the basic documents at Nuremberg. Temple? Temple, of all places, and I don't know what the connection is, but there was one issue of the Temple Law Review, and I have it in my uh, Adler office next door, that had, to me, the most basic documents to give you what everybody wants is the the airplane view and the worm's eye view, the yeah. bird's eye view and the worm's eye view. Exactly. And the airplane view of Nuremberg was never better laid out than in Jackson's, number one, his opening right. statement to right. the court. Mm -hmm. Number two, in his report to Truman summing it up, both 
comparatively recent, uh, both comparatively brief documents. Yeah. But they do give you beautifully that total view, that airplane view, and then you get into the worm's eye view. And the worm's eye view, I don't demean it, it's just as important as the bird's eye view. In other words, Jackson was the great lawyer in yes. a situation, like a brand, I see. He, he was a master of the telescope and the microscope. Yeah. It was the, as far as I can see, I never sat down with a single witness. It was all documentary. Yeah. They, somebody, some office would be responsible for routing the material to you. It would have an enormous range. It would range all the way from uh, excerpts from books of specialist scholars on the lawless road to power, the rise of Hitlerism, the rise yeah. of the Third Reich, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah to capture German documents. And someone was making some decisions on relevancy. They would know that I was working on the criminality of the party and would root the flow to me in those terms, whether I was working on Bohm or Hess and make that, that, uh, those initial threshold judgments there. So that what you got was largely screened material. And it was, the old story was it was an, uh, an ignoble excess of uh, material. Right. In most criminal trials, the problem is to get the drop on the accused to find the facts. This is the first time I've ever seen a criminal trial when they brought the evidence in in 10-ton yeah. trucks, <laughs> file cabinets. We yeah. were talking yesterday about how, yeah. how they kept books with Teutonic thoroughness, the incredible industry of yeah. the Germans as archivists. Whether it was heaven or hell, they kept, uh, they, they kept their history together. I, th I think as a reward, as a little outing, that's the way it struck me at the time, yeah. he arranged to take the staff or some of them on a trip to Berchtesgaden. Yes. To me it was just a name, and yeah. he had uh, somehow got access to a commandeer to whatever, Hitler's private train, yes. and he led us on a tour through this train, yeah. and finally we got into Hitler's private car with it, where it had gold uh, uh, fixtures and, and appointments, and to see him squatting in this tub with his full dress academicals and his <laughs> morning coat draped over his arm was memorable <laughs> and unforgettable. <laughs> One was, speaking of the U.S. Supreme Court, we are final not because we're infallible, we're infallible because we're final. <laughs> he had that little <laughs> sense of irony. Well, I, I, I um, have of course, read very closely his opener, and it's a, it's a, it's a masterful piece of writing and I enjoy that style very much, but I must confess, as an old speechwriter, I was a speechwriter for many, many years for uh, Nelson Rockefeller, um, that it's almost the writing of another century. It has a grandiloquence about it. That's true. That's dead right. You're right on the mark. It's Gladstonian. Yep. yep. What is the one uh, he, in England they, they had that... Uh, special editor collection of essays, Spencerian almost, yeah, yeah. in style, and I guess that either turns you off or it ignites you and it turns me on. I no, I, li I like it very much, and I li uh, what also I admire in uh, anybody who has the erudition to make literary allusions and references, which he, he can do very well. True. Uh, the other, just uh, yesterday I was reading again something which I will misquote, but it's where and in, in I think in his closing, where he said, he, qu he quotes Shakespeare to the effect then then if these crimes did not happen, and he quotes Shakespeare, then, uh, then they were not slain. Yeah. I can't remember what they're... Absolutely. It's what just, are all these widows doing here? It's absolutely perfect. It's, it's a, right on, on target. Um, well, I wanted to ask about uh, your um, party case, the uh, prosecution of the Nazi party. Who... Who actually uh, went in court? Uh, which prosecutor handled that one? Well, let's see. You had two things. Yeah. One was you would uh, make an oral presentation, and the other was the uh, written brief. Now, on the party, I wrote the brief. Yes. And, and uh, Colonel Story presented it to the tribunal. Yes. And I have a picture of, uh, of Colonel Story presenting the my brief, and I'm sitting alongside of him with the face masked in anguish. <laughs> Occasionally they would probe him about a point, 
and uh, in effect he would say, you see, that being up on the, the concreteness of the record, yeah. and well, in effect, we will abandon that point. Yes. And uh, so not again for attribution. He uh, began to enjoy the reputation of being the butcher of Nuremberg, butchering the British. <laughs> You had mentioned the other day uh, w watching the rebuilding of the courthouse. Uh, try, if you if, if you can, reconstruct for me your uh, your reactions and your memories of seeing that happen. Well, um, one thing was to have a Navy type such as myself assigned to Nuremberg. Yes. You're out of the water. You're not a blue water sailor. Right. Not that I ever was. But you wouldn't be wearing your regular uniform because you would be inland and coping yeah. with the problems of land living. Yeah. So they allowed me to wear a chief petty officer shirt, which is a black shirt. Right. And the, you would have arrived, I think, in Nuremberg, may have opened during the summer, yeah. or was it the winter, one or the other, and uh, it would be hot as heck, so you wouldn't be wearing your jacket. Right. And so you would uh, arrive wearing a black tie and a black shirt, and this would shock the natives uh, crazy because it would look like you were an SS man <laughs> and you were armed with a pistol during the early days yeah. we were and they would wonder why is this one one of us left at large <laughs> like this and you could see the consternation and they chatter like blue jays over every time you were nearby so, uh, yeah. so that uh, when we first rode up to that courtroom I had made friends with a fellow forgotten his last name his first name was Bill he was E either in translation or in document control. Yeah. But we hit it off together pretty well, yeah. and he was uh, something of an athlete. He ended up at Michigan. I think he played on the freshman football team. Yeah. And he and I loved to get out there in the courtyard where all the spilling was going on and throw a football around. Right. And uh, he was obviously a PFC, and I had a couple of bars, and this, you could see the bafflement on the faces of the SS, oh, yes. how an officer and an enlisted man could be yeah. having fun together yeah. and being palsy wowsy together. Yeah. So that little impact, the difference between the American um, civilian type mm. army and our jeu d'esprit and uh, the way the, the Nazis did it was a sharp contrast, day and night contrast. What, what was your Navy rank at that point? I went in as an ensign, yes. the lowest of the low, and uh, was trained for military government right. in the Far East. We didn't have any real estate out there, so I was sent to the Columbia School of Military Government. Yeah. And s since the Far East hadn't opened up again uh, for temporary duty, I was sent over to uh, London, where I worked with the G5 of uh, the 12th U.S. Army Group. Right. And I was a legal officer on the staff of General, General Bradley. Yeah through the Rhineland, and then, yeah. as I mentioned to you, I got, after that, I was assigned back to um, General Court Marshal in London yeah. for the Navy, and then that man from, uh, you've got to find out his name, he obviously was a corporate lawyer, this, this was not a crimmy, grubby yeah. trial lawyer, yeah. uh, he was a sun crown type fellow, real classical class type fellow, and he yeah. had this executive order, and he, anybody that was in uniform, he could freeze, right. notwithstanding the number of points he had. So yeah. he asked me if I'd be interested, and so I mentioned he I jumped yeah. in with all four. Yeah. Listen, but uh, we, so we got there at uh, Nuremberg, and this courthouse is under repair, yeah. and the, the working crews of the construction sites were all these SS men. And the poetry of that was not lost on me. I don't think you had to be very sensitive to see it. Yeah. And here these fellows are laboring like uh, workhorses, pack mules of the sun, rebuilding the temple of justice in which their leadership <laughs> is to be tried. It's Maybe J.G., and yeah. while I was at Nuremberg, I went from J.G. to senior lieutenant. I think I was the youngest lawyer to address the tribunal, which, that this has nothing to do with merit, but the accident of birth, I was the youngest one. There is a moment uh, in the courtroom that I'm very interested in, I wonder if you might have have been there that day when they show the atrocity films. Do you have any memory of that? I don't. The, the ones I remember, and I'll never forget, would be the uh, 
when they came to the section of the indictment that had to do with the stealing and the misappropriation of cultural and artistic property. Yes, yes. And uh, the, the Germans, again, with Teutonic thoroughness, would keep books on every piece that they stole. Like they'd have the Bruges altarpiece. Oh, yes. And then it would be entered in one of these big catalogs. Bruges altarpiece, the location from which it was uh, torn appropriated. Right. Its value in the local currency, Pengo, Lay, Rubles, whatever the heck it was, yes. and its values in German Reichmarks, and as I recall, its locus in Germany. That would be for each item. The, the, I think the, uh, the Bayou Tapestry would yes. be an entry in there, and so on and so on. And to show that, uh, you know, GI stole a lot of stuff, not every right on their camera was paid for a lot of stuff was liberated yeah. but <laughs> th th their stuff was done not retail but wholesale and at the leadership level right uh, it was uh, someone said there's th three kinds of larceny petty grand and glorious <laughs> <laughs> I think theirs was on the, obviously in the mass they brought it in by freight cars and then just a section we had, again had that sense of the trial error and the drama I think he had all the lights put out in the courtroom as I recall right. and then he had these catalogs wheeled in on uh, yeah. wheelbarrows yeah. and the lights go on and here you have some 30 odd volumes uh, in which they had chartered and kept permanent memorials of their confiscation they had raised theft to the level of national policy <laughs> that was an impact I'll never forget and you certainly had a a glorious thief right there in the front row in Hermann Goering. Hermann Goering. I think it may have been your friend, the railroad lawyer, who said uh, he, he is presented to the world a lot as a jovial, sometimes a buffoon. He was the jolliest pirate that ever slid a throat <laughs> or scuttled a ship, I think. Oh, is that Alderman said that? Because uh, that I came across in a, uh, a marvelous book I, I was reading yesterday by a, a, a Russian who was on the scene there by the name of Polterok. And he quotes that line, but he doesn't give uh, uh, who said it at the trial. He said, and Amer one of the members of the American staff made this observation about the jolly Herman Goering. I think, you can readily check this, I think Alderman presented the case against Goering. Yeah, yeah. Jackson may have cross-examined him, but I think, mm -hmm. subject to correction, that yeah. it was Alderman that put in the case against Goering. And the impression of, of them is, again, their, not only their professionalism, but what I call omnicompetence. Yes. And what stands out in my mind is uh, immediately before the war, I had a job at the Board of Economic Warfare. And one time, the issue before the House was whether the USA should engage in the preemptive purchase of the Portuguese sardine catch. <laughs> world-shaking issue, but of course it had its military implications because they squeeze these fish and they get these oils and that are used for vitamins and yeah. good nutrition of the troops and so on. The Americans didn't need them, but the Nazis were starving for them, so the idea is let's buy them so they can't get them. And this is big issue, and uh, at this meeting, there were about 26 people in the room, yeah. 25 of them from the American side and one Englishman. And they, the Americans would do, they'd have a specialist on maritime bottoms, how much yes. sea space was available. They'd have a guy uh, who's a specialist on division and foreign exchange in the Peseta position. They'd have somebody that was a specialist on nutrition and a, a counterintelligence fellow and the Joint mm -hmm. Chiefs of Staff and God knows what. And the British had one guy that knew all facets of this problem. And it stood out in my mind yes. that the, the same approach was at the trial. Very few, but omnicompetent and very professional. I had a great respect for them. Well, confirming what you've just said, uh, under uh, Justice Jackson, there are 600 staffers. Under Fife, there are 168. Did you have dealings with uh, Jim Rowe, Bob Stewart, Adrian Fisher, Only that they were uh, part of the, they, they were the princes of the, uh, of Jackson's entourage, and they were at the advisory level. There are many 
German Jews driven out of Germany by Hitler who uh, settle in the United States. They wind up in the U.S. Armed Forces, and many of them are back at Nuremberg as translators, interpreters, uh, working on documents. Uh, did you have contact with many of these people? Certainly with some of them. Uh, for instance, uh, again and again I would be jolted when I would look at a English translation of an official German document. Yeah. And it would be in uh, very coarse, almost street language. Yes. And uh, to save time, the explanation that came through was, well, the translator's qualifications was his father was a butcher in Milwaukee, <laughs> and he knew a little German, and that would make it plausible that it would come out reading that way, but it was supposed to be a translation from the Reich's Gazette's blog, or a, or a speech of, by, by Goebbels over the radio. A very a profound speech, like uh, uh, like when, when Goebbels would, uh, part of the charge was that when American pilots would bail out, as uh, members of a belligerent force and the German people would gather around them to lynch them. And we had directives from Goebbels and others, Bormann too, as I recall, yeah. saying that the German police will keep a hands-off policy because these people are brigands and ruffians and right. tear them limb from limb. Well, that was uh, heady stuff, you know, to show commission of outright war crimes yeah. and authorizing them. And then you'd, you'd get the translations of these things that where you'd say, gee, this is the, this is the accents of thuggery in the street. <laughs> to put no finer point upon it. And where the hell are they getting these translators? Yeah. Not from the University of Vienna. <laughs> or from the Harvard uh, German Department. It's like, you know, like war, you take, you use the physical and human resources you've got available right. to you and most of the GIs want to go home everybody wants to go home I got my points mom and blackberry yeah. pie I, I'm mm -hmm. out of here um, do you remember the uh, fellow who worked for the prosecution he was a, a, a German refugee who comes back named Robert Kempner oh well, Kempner was all over the place yeah. and uh, perhaps he was one of those that is uh, full of self the upright vowel he was an omnipresent Yes, I would say that. I had that impression of him. When the uh, opening for the Chief uh, Justice, uh, when the Chief Justice ship opens, when Harlan Stone dies, that uh, it's this feud with Black that probably cost uh, Jackson uh, the seat. And I wonder if there was scuttlebutt about that. Were you people talking about it at the time? Yes, there would be talk about it. I don't know how informed the talk would be, but there would be s strong feelings. Yeah. I think everybody was high on the justice. Yeah. Maybe it's because of self-esteem you feel identified with him, but yes. I think possibly on the merits. This yeah. idea that he was a lawyer's lawyer, he was a law student's lawyer, he was a judge's lawyer, he was a compliant lawyer. Yes. How do you spell that? C-O-M-P-L-E-A-T. Is the compliant angler. Exactly. Same usage. Okay. Like non pareil <laughs> and behold, a letter follows me. Uh, in effect, I got it in my file somewhere. Lambert, you slipped away without her knowing it. <laughs> I want to say thus and so. And yeah. It was, uh, how do you say, uh, it was noblesse oblige. He had that side of it. Yeah. Was that patrician side. Of it. And uh, what is the French expression for the le beau geste, the beautiful gesture? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that was part of him. His eye was on the sparrow then. Yeah. Why, why, why had you left? Well, my work was over, the case had been in, and yeah. I didn't have enough spectatoritis to sit around and watch yes. the rest of it, especially the cross-examination. Yeah. Like, like I say, in criminal trials, there are two defenses. I didn't do it, or I did it under coercion. Yeah. And, and they, that was the great thing about Goering's presence in the dark. I did it. We were right. <laughs> Sorry, we lost. Next time we'll do it, and we'll make it stick. Yeah. See, he made it a confrontation. The rest of it was like a male yeah. glee club. I've tried to compress uh, this experience at Nuremberg into three points. Why I, why I think that the uh, Nuremberg inquest was not just uh, getting 20-odd heads on the silver charger. Yeah. Um, number one, it contributed to the law structure of peace. Yes. Uh, 
the, the ideas, it, it established, number two, that aggressive war was the greatest of all crimes because it, it encompassed all the rest. Yes. In other words, if aggressive war is not a crime, how in the hell can you keep a pickpocket or a fraudulent paving contractor in jail? Yeah. Number three, it established the principle of individual accountability. Yes. No longer could Hitler say, well, I'm the head of state and you couldn't charge me on mantled in immunity. Yeah. And nobody who worked under Hitler, at the end of my brief on the Nazi party, uh, I was being, I, I said, uh, the names of these defendants are not writ in water. It, mm. If it had not been for them, Hitler would have lived out his years an unemployed, talentless artist yes. in Austria. But they put him in the sun in the place of imperial power. And they must answer for it. In other words, if aggressive war comes, not only do GIs and corporals die, right. but the human beings, the industrialists, the engineers, the financiers, those who engineer the conspiracy, into their hands we will pass the poison chalice. Yes. There's individual accountability, and I think that's more than rhetoric. And lastly, I think it's, a, to, to my knowledge, the first careful study, a post-mortem study, of the nature of the police state and the fascism. I'll never forget a conversation I had with that wonderful, wonderful man. I wonder if he ever crossed your cognizance. Uh, he looked like Lincoln, the way he was Lincolnian. He was the American ambassador to the court of St. James. Uh, he came out of New Hampshire. Was it Wynant? Wynant. Yes. Exactly. While he was American ambassador, and I was a uh, Navy type, uh, working on the military government, and the, I was writing a term paper for my wife, uh, Compact that I had made with her, she would shift from from uh, her Southern Stetson school and go to Barnard. I would write this term paper for her, and it was on, uh, in effect, the strategic importance of the Philippines. Yes. And uh, here I'm grinding away at night after duty in the American Embassy Library that I had access to, and about uh, six thirty one night, I hear the door open and I look up and here's this gaunt Lincolnian, a very handsome man. And he said, uh, Ensign, what are you doing here? And I leapt up and signed off and acknowledged myself and told him exactly what I was doing. He says, what have you got plans for dinner? I'm like an ass. I've never forgiven myself. I said, I've already had it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a couple of nights later, he came back and he said, are you still working on the term paper? And I said, yes, sir, I am. I got to deliver what I promised. And he said, what are you writing about? And I told him about the Philippines. Well, of course, he had been the American, whatever the term is, pro-consul administrator of the yes. Philippines. And he started to, to visit a little bit about the crucial issues in the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis the USA. And then we got around to the war, and he said, well, the big thing we've learned about the war is that you must take the dragon of fascism when it's an evil egg and stamp it out mm. and not wait until it's a full-fledged dragon devouring yes. the democratic damsels a la carte from the menu. Yes. He said, in other words, we must not wait until the sun is gleaming on their bayonets. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I put that in the term paper. Great, great as, as a distinguished American statesman has observed, mm. I saw him some years later when he had come from a meeting with the Russians when they were working out the big four and dividing up Germany. I said, sir, uh, you've just come from a meeting with the Russians. You must be full of care, if not compassion. He says, no, I'm full of vodka. Go <laughs> <laughs> down these names. Uh, among the judges, Lawrence. Uh, um, you, you can, if you don't react, I'll just go on to the next name. I think he was like right out of... Uh, not Rumpole of Bailey Street, but uh, Rumpole out of Dickens. Yep. He, he looked the way he should have looked yep. and behaved the way he would expect the chief magistrate to behave. Burkitt. Uh, marvelous in that his background was as a trial lawyer. Uh, I had I took my legal education in England, and so you'd read the New York, the, the London Times uh, daily uh, reports. And he was always in the Times. Uh, he was a great defamation lawyer, which was yep. a great gold digging action in England. <laughs> he was a lawyer's lawyer and really knew his stuff and he had the uh, gift of tongue. Um, I think Churchill said, have you heard this? Uh, I think it was said of Birkin. 
He says, there but for the grace of God goes God. Oh, is that who he said it about? I, I, I thought he said it about Clement Attlee, but it doesn't matter. No, but it may have been still someone other than those two. It's, see, I think Burkett was a, a luminary in the Labor Party. Yeah. Subject to correction. Yeah. yeah. Biddle. Biddle. Uh, aristocrat. Um, uh, a responsible aristocrat. Aristocrat in the best sense of the term. Yeah. It almost makes you have, feel melancholy about the American Revolutionary War. Yeah. They'd all been like Biddle. I don't think the war would have taken place. <laughs> uh, High-born, well-born, beautifully educated, uh, sharp mind. Um, one thing, maybe this better not be for attribution. The, the, the scuttlebutt was that he did not get along well with uh, his associate justice, a man from Carolina. Parker. Parker. And the story on Parker, and I'm sure you're up on this, is that he was heavy in the running to replace Cardozo, and the labor unions were down on him. He had delivered some opinions, I think, while he was on the Fourth Circuit that were a little, or yeah. perceived to be anti-labor. Yeah. And they moved against him, and uh, he was his name was either never submitted, or uh, Freund quotes Black sometime as saying the Parker that... Uh, that did something after Nuremberg was not the Parker before the nomination to succeed Cardozo. In other words, he grew through the experience oh, of yeah, Nuremberg. Yeah. And um, they, the story that the scuttlebutt we got on the operational level is that there was they regarded each other with what Mickey Boo would call modulated joy. <laughs> enjoy each other too much. And I, I suppose if if if, uh, if I were in a room with uh, uh, the, the Philadelphia and the aristocrat, I'd be feeling ill at ease too and holding my hands. I can understand Parker being a little ill at ease yes. because of all of his finish and polish. And, mm. and it was not varnish, it was finish that yes. uh, he had. And uh, so I remember uh, walking down a corridor of a train once on the way to Paris and I looked in, and there was Judge Parker, and I paid my respects to him, and then I said, gee, I better get out of here because I see Judge Burkett. Uh, uh, who am I trying to say? The judge from Philadelphia. Yeah, Biddle. Judge Biddle. Mm -hmm. I said, Judge Biddle's coming, and you'll want to visit with him. He says, no, you sit tight. I see quite enough of Judge Biddle. <laughs> 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 now, I'm sure he didn't know that I had known some of the scuttlebutt in the background, but it made perfect great sense. Uh, so, that's great. How about the Russians, Nikachenko, Volchkov? No, I think they were something that um, you just abided. You know, the, that forest massacre, we had heard things about that. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. But um, I think a key concept was that under the Charter, nobody would swing or nobody could be convicted unless there were at least three votes against it. That's right. So follow my logic. If, if that's correct, nobody was hung by the neck and hanged by the neck until dead. Without, and the Russian vote could not be decisive one way or the other. Right. You had to have three others. That's right. You'd always have three others. Right. So the Russians' presence in that sense didn't make a difference. And, and the, I suppose the harsh question is how could you exclude them, 20 million dead? Right. And when, I can imagine how I would have felt to when uh, Hess going over there and uh, mobilizing the Western armies uh, against them, the, this uh, paranoia they feel and xenophobia the world has ganged up against us. If you, even if you can't justify it, you can perhaps go some distance in understanding how they would enter into that stall and have their pack. Yes. Because they were this uh, agrarian agricultural you know, country and to mobilize just the physical process of bringing those peasant troops in off the steps into the front lines by ox cart and plow, they needed time, time, time. And what that wretched pack did was to give them time. Yes. And they didn't waste it in the meantime. So those were thoughts and considerations and counter considerations that would swirl through your mind when people yes. say, what are they doing in the dock and why aren't they in the defendant's dock? Right. And, you know, given taking humanity all in all, which uh, hopefully is the way God will take us, I'll put it all in together. This was not a, a contest between black and white, but 
shifting penumbras of gray. Uh, I don't know whether this would be of interest to you or not. Um, it, it just happened by accident that part of the brief against the party involved the persecution of the Christian church and clergy by the Nazis to show yes. that they were trying to get total control yes. and beat up on the nuns and the pastors and interfere with their pastoral letters and confiscate their property and, and throw them in the concentration camp, etc. So after the trials were over, I traveled south uh, with um, Martin Rowe, who was one of the hangers on, the fellow yes. who was an assistant uh, state's attorney from Baltimore, and Walt Bruno. And we stopped by Rome, and uh, uh, Mort Rome got the idea of calling on the Pope, and <laughs> showing him what use we had made of uh, yeah. the documentation at Nuremberg, yes. because he made available to the to the prosecution very uh, influential and important evidence, because it would come under the seal of the Papal Secretary of State. Yeah. And the prosecution could say, we now offer an evidence exhibit 100 under the seal of the papal secretary of state, dated so and so and so on, and then, mm -hmm. quote, read it into the record. And there might be a list of the number of priests and nuns that had been uh, thrown in the concentration camp or mistreated or yes. stolen property or what have you. And uh, I also had some of these pictures of the defendants in the dock. One of the best pictures, I think, of all of them I had that I got from this man that you mentioned. Uh, Diderio. Diderio. And uh, they, they uh, explained to us in advance that you refer to the Pope as your holiness. And uh, Mort would get a little excited sometimes when we were visiting with him. And I, I showed him this uh, picture of the defendants in the dock, and he was very interested in it, and he made comments about various ones. And when he came to Van, Van Papen, who of course was a very active, influential Catholic, Catholic centrist, he said, we do not think that he fought like a Nazi. And Rome blurted out, well, Pope. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pope. Maybe he didn't think like a Nazi, but he sure acted like one. <laughs> so, I say, down, boy, down, boy. And uh, he said to me, you, you have brought this picture for us? And I lied to uh, Jesus' representative on the planet, and I said, of course, Your Holiness, I gave him my best picture, which I was primarily saving for myself. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. That's kind of uh, interesting, I think. Your, 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 uh, your uh, colleague, Morton, how do you spell his last name? Um, Rome. Yeah, R-O-M-E, that's it. Oh, his, his name is Rome as well. Correct. Yeah, okay. And he's, uh, I believe, last I heard, he was in Baltimore. He, yeah. His family owned a lot of chains of theaters, of cinemas, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I see. Uh, we had a very interesting experience coming back. Uh, we ended up on the same troop ship, uh, Mort and I. Yes. And he was a lieutenant commander, as I recall. And by that time, I was senior grade, and uh, we were bunked down. The only space open to us was in the break. <laughs> we were bunked in the break. And in the course of our transit back to New York City, yeah. it, uh, it appeared that some GIs who had come aboard, I think, at some Polish port, mm. had a little mascot, a little Polish boy, in their duffel bag, and they smuggled him on board. Yeah. And then in the troop ship, it would be cafeteria service. You'd go through these long lines, mm. and they'd load it up, and they would take extra helpings, and then go back to wherever they were billeted, and they'd feed this little boy. And in transit, he was discovered. And he was placed in the brig and placed under detention and so on. And these GIs were being charged, and Rome heard about this, and Rome had a strongly developed political sense. And he gets in touch with the GIs involved in this little fellow and drew up a power of attorney to represent them and the little boy and getting admitted to the United States and not having penal sanctions applied to them. Then he goes to see the executive officer and says, there's going to be hell to pay when we get ashore because we're going to hold a press conference. And... Uh, we're going to say, we're just back from the Nuremberg trials in, in which we were interested in bringing the rule of law after the liberation of Europe. And isn't there room someplace in our country for a little eight-year-old boy? Can't we uh, bring justice or mercy to him? 
By the way, the Pope keeps saying as, uh, as he went around looking at this picture, he'd say, we want to see justice done, but after justice, mercy. But uh, he knows he put justice first. Yeah. Was he justice yeah, done after yeah, justice, yeah, mercy? Yeah. And uh, so here's, here's uh, old Rome, and we, when we got ashore, he had the press conference, and the next thing you know, the New York Times picked it up. This would be in their morgue. And uh, the Attorney General of the United States, Ramsey Clark's father, Tom Clark, in effect came down and said, there is room for one more little Polish yeah. lad, and took him in. And, uh, and it, Rome, Mark Rome didn't get to enjoy the fruits of that fine ploy, of his, that project, of his, that fine enterprise, and his disdain for the tangles of bureaucracy, because his, uh, upon arriving in the we docked, he learned that his father had died, and yeah. they didn't save that news until he arrived. So I got the brunt of the telephone calls that should have come to him because he was the initiator of and the innovator of it. That's a very touching story. I think it is. Yes, it certainly is. And I think that little boy ended up in Connecticut. His, the lads who brought him over, uh, he was assimilated into some Connecticut community, and I yeah. trust today is flourishing. 